Hey everybody, and welcome back to Submarine History. Today, uh, we're going to wrap up the series on Enigma by taking a uh, look at it from the perspective of the uh, Allies. Not going to lie, this is an extremely deep and complex topic. Uh, one that I'm not sure I'll ever fully understand myself. Uh, and here I am going to try to distill it down for you in 20 to 30 minutes. So um, there's that. Um, I'm positive mistakes will be made on my part explaining it. So if anything doesn't make sense or you know something I've said is wrong, uh, please leave me comments below so that we can discuss it and try to sort it out. I do read every comment and I try my best to uh, answer viewer questions. <clears throat> now I'll be going back and forth between uh, English and German terminology, but mostly I want to keep the briefing in the simplest English possible. So having said that, uh, let's get on with it. And really, uh, what better way to talk about Enigma than to uh, talk about the Imitation Game? For those of you who haven't seen The Imitation Game, uh, it's a 2014 American historical drama about the early days of Bletchley Park uh, during World War II. Uh, it did win an Academy Award, I think, for Best Adapted Screenplay. Um, I personally enjoy the film, um, but as I said, it, you know, Enigma is a massive topic to take on, and uh, you know, certain liberties are taken by Hollywood when you're trying to like pack that down into a two-hour story. Um, but we'll get to that. So, uh, in this opening slide, we have Alan Turing, played by Benedict Cumberbatch, Joan Clark, played by Kira Knightley, Hugh Alexander, played by Matt Good, Peter Hilton, played by Matt Beard, and John Carencross, played by Alan Leach. Now, John Carencross actually wasn't at Bletchley Park at the start of the war. Uh, he didn't come to Bletchley Park, I think, until 1942, maybe 1943. Uh, but he was actually a uh, double agent for the Soviets. Interesting to know, the, uh, probably the, the weird thing about this movie is that they don't include Gordon Welchman. <laughs> um, Gordon Welchman played a very important role at Bletchley Park. He was a contemporary of Alan Turing's. He was there at the start. He actually made important uh, improvements to the bombs that Alan Turing designed. And um, the only reason I can think that they did not include him in this movie is that uh, it was going to become difficult to control the story and tell it, you know, having to account for like these ex you know, the, that extra character because he was a very large figure at uh, Bletchley Park. So you just kind of got to take that in stride. Okay, our uh, references for today. Um, I'll just point out that the Cypher Machine and Cryptology.com website, the CryptoMuseum.com website, the Bletchley Park uh, website, uh, the book Alan Turing the Enigma by Andrew Hodges, uh, and uh, Wikipedia for uh, research on Marion Rzewski, those are your core resources uh, for this briefing. And you can lose a lot of time visiting those sites and just reading and studying and trying to understand Enigma. And this is the house, the original building at Bletchley Park, uh, used early on uh, as the place where the uh, crypto analysts, crypto analysts worked. Uh, eventually, when the staff grew out, they became too big for the building, and the crypto analysts moved out to the various huts. And uh, this building was used by Commander Denniston and his uh, operations staff. So the British Government Code and Cipher School was established in 1919 right after uh, World War I. And it consolidated code breakers from, world, from the World War I British Admiralty's Room 40 and the British Army's MI1, uh, which is Military Intelligence Section 1. This was very forward-looking of the British to combine their uh, crypto analytic resources from the Army and the Navy. Uh, this is something that the other nations did not do and I think this is one thing that gave Bletchley Park a decided adv advantage during the war, having these two uh, separate entities working together jointly to uh, break Enigma and share the information. And they did other things. Um, they handled a vast variety of code breaking and decryption work, not just Enigma. Uh, at the height of World War II, approximately 10,000 persons worked at Bletchley Park and in the uh, surrounding areas. Uh, interesting to note that approximately 75% of the staff at Bletchley Park were women. After the war, uh, the GC and CS 
would be reorganized and it would become the government communications headquarters in 1946, which I believe still exists today. And here, uh, the British Government Code and Cipher School, the GCNCS, had moved Bletchley Park from London only a few weeks before the German invasion of Poland. Uh, and it was still early in the process of staffing up to handle code breaking uh, when the war started. Okay, um, so on the left we have Commander Alexander Deniston, uh, and he was head of operations for uh, GCNCS from, during the war from September 1939 to February 1942. Uh, in the movie, he's played by uh, Charles Dance. He had a long history of cryptographic work um, going actually back, uh, I think, to World War I. Um, but actually, his longevity at uh, GCNCS probably worked against him. He didn't really seem to have the vision that was required to get the GCNCS to reach its potential as it related to the um, breaking of Enigma. And he didn't necessarily see the value of the bomb as part of that work. So Turing uh, and company, you know, they felt they were being starved of resources, and they did actually approach Churchill in late 1941, which resulted in a massive inflow of resources and uh, also resulted in the replacement of Deniston by Travis. Uh, now, in the movie, you're kind of given the impression that uh, Alan Turing, right at the start of the war, you know, writes this letter to Churchill and uh, all of a sudden gets the money to do the bombs and, you know, gets himself, you know, promoted and put in charge of the operation. But it didn't really happen quite like that. It wasn't really, you know, that moment when they went to Churchill, that actually, like I said, happens later in 1941. But I think for purposes of the movie, they moved that up. So and this is the layout of the uh, GCNCS at Bletchley Park, uh, as I believe it remains today. I haven't been to Bletchley Park, you know, I'm here in the States, but I do look forward to someday to going out there and spending some time there. But as you can see today, uh, you know, obviously the mansion is still there. Um, Huts 3 and 6 are still there. Uh, that's where the Army Air Force Enigma work took place. Huts 4 and 8, where Naval Enigma took place. Um, Huts 11 and 11A were the original buildings where the bombs were put uh, until they got to the point where they made enough bombs they would actually move those off-site to uh, separate facilities that were uh, not, not too far from Bletchley Park itself. Um, and then uh, on, he, on here, they actually they still have Block B, where Italian and uh, Japanese dis, uh, decryption took place. Originally, at the start of the war, they just, you know, they build the huts initially. But then, again, as things become more complex and the staff grows, they actually actually build these larger buildings that they call blocks so they could handle the uh, workers and the, and, the, and the flow of the uh, message traffic. Okay, so here we have um, Gordon Welshman and Hugh Alexander. Uh, they worked in Huts 3 and 6, and that's where the decryption, translation, and analysis of German Air Force and Army Enigma communications took place. Huts 4 and 8, uh, that's where Alan Turing, Hugh Alexander would eventually work there along with Joan Clark. For Huts 4 and 8, that's where the decryption, translation, and analysis of German Navy Enigma communications took place. So how did Bletchley Park actually break Enigma? So the story actually starts back in, uh, goes back to 1932 with the Polish General Staff Cipher Bureau. Uh, they did the early work on the cryptanalysis of Enigma between 1932 and 1939, which became the foundation for the future work by Bletchley Park. Now the main figures working for the Poles were Marian Rzewski, uh, Jerzy Rzicki, and uh, Henrik Zagalski. So at the time that these gentlemen were working on breaking Enigma, this table represents uh, by year which Enigma machines were actually in operation. Uh, so starting back in 1932, we have the, uh, the Wehrmacht and Luftwaffe, they're using the Enigma 1, and the Kriegsmarine is using the M1 and M2 Enigma machines. These, these machines are all basically the same. Uh, they have three rotor, they can use three rotors, uh, rotors 1 through 3, and they have ref reflectors B and C. And that's how um, the German military used Enigma 
up until about 1938, uh, where we get a split, and two things happen. The, in 1938, the uh, German Army and Air Force, they introduced two additional rotors, rotors four and five. And the Kriegsmarine, their fork of, of the machine, they actually add uh, rotors six, seven, and eight. And the red box indicates that's the period of the time that uh, the Poles were actually working on their uh, cryptanalysis effort. I don't know how much work they would have tried. For the Poles, I'm guessing the majority of their effort was focused on German Army and Air Force Enigma, and maybe not so much the, uh, the Kriegsmarine, how they were implementing it. But it's interesting to note here, down here, uh, as we go down the uh, chart, and then on the right-hand side, it's in 1942 that the Kriegsmarine introduces the M4 version of Enigma. And that gives us thin reflectors B and C, along with rotors 1 through 8, okay, and then also uh, thin rotors uh, gamma and beta. So again, uh, the Polish Cipher Bureau had, since 1932, been working on the problem of breaking Enigma 1. In order to do this, they utilized group theory mathematics uh, and pinched Enigma 1 key setting sheets from the French. And they used those two things to solve the wiring settings of the Enigma 1 rotors and the reflectors by the end of 1932. So once the structure of Enigma 1 components was known, attacks on individual message keys could be performed using mathematics in order to determine the daily machine settings for the Enigma 1. So the next three slides explain uh, in greatly simplified terms how the poles would try to break messages. Um, and this is one of those areas where humans not adhering to strict procedures could jeopardize the system. Lazy operators using the same key over and over, for example, a girl's name, uh, could provide code breakers insight into the daily settings of the machine if they could get enough messages to uh, compare it to each other. So on this slide, what we're seeing, this is just kind of a refresher. With Army and Air Force, we have a message header that's tr transmitted in plain text, plus the message key, plus the actual message. And for our example here, the plain text key uh, could be BHX. And encrypted twice, typing, setting your enigma to the daily settings, typing in BHX twice over, that could give us the encrypted key. In this case, it's FUAKPQ. And your encrypted message would look like this. You would have that um, you would have that message key at the start repeated twice, and you'd have it at the end repeated twice. And then between them, you actually have the encrypted message. And this is very simplified, just for illustrative purposes. So what the polls noticed was that when you type BHX B and BHX again, there's a relationship between the first and fourth letter, represented by F and K in yellow, H and H, which are represented in red by U and P, and X and X, which are, which are uh, related to A and Q, shown in blue. So what the polls would do, they would get enough messages during, during the day, and they would start looking at these, at these message keys, and they would start to see patterns and this is an example where this would say be four separate messages. These are the keys for four separate messages. And they would see that there was a relationship between B and T. And that's represented by the B and the T in that square. They saw that there was a relationship between E and L and a relationship between T and E. So they're able to see that all these letters are starting to be related to each other. And it's through that that they're able to attack and try to get the daily settings. So increasing improvements to Enigma by the German military uh, leads to the development of the bomb to automate the crypto cryptanalysis process. So in addition to the bomb, which is which was a machine where you could you could you could basically program it. You could say, I think rotor one is in position one, I think rotor two is in position two, and I think position rotor three is in is, is in the third or slowest moving rotor position. 
And what they would do is they could test those settings on the bomb and they could use that to see if they could actually get the messages to make sense. And uh, that would indicate to them that, hey, you know, we've got the right, the right settings. In addition to the bomb, they had these perforated or what they called Zagalski sheets since they're attributed to, to him. And they were used to determine possible starting positions and settings of rotors and reflectors based on the message indicator uh, key patterns. So basically, this is really difficult to explain, but each rotor, it's got 26 positions, and then you have a ring, then you have a ring setting where you can do an offset on each of those rotors. So each rotor has uh, 26 times 26 or 676 different like letter combinations. And these perforators, perforated sheets were related to that. And uh, what they would do is they would, they would take a guess on what the rotor settings were, and then they would use these sheets overlaying them on each other progressively until they reduced the number of perforations to one that was still visible and that would tell them hey we got the rotors and the reflectors correct now these sheets ignored the plug board which could be solved by the bomb um, after the rotor and reflector settings were determined saving time so in uh, late December 1938, uh, German military, as I said, military, uh, German military increases the number of rotors for the Army Air Force to five and the Navy to eight. Then in early January 1939, the German military increases the number of plugboard connections, I think from uh, four to six to seven to ten. And these improvements just they just overwhelm the personnel and financial resources uh, of the Poles. And around the end of July 1939, the Poles actually meet with the British and the French to brief them on their work with Enigma and kind of turn over the work that they've done. Now, before we go back to Bletchley, uh, it's an, it should be noted that uh, Rzhevsky and his team, they were able to escape Poland, and they did continue their work uh, in France, and I think eventually they went to England. So, these are the challenges of the naval enigma at the start of World War II. All right, um, the M3 Enigma, that's the three rotor machine, it has a pool of eight rotors to choose from. You have no information on rotors six, seven, and eight. Rotors one through five had been solved uh, in combination between the poles and Bletchley Park, so they knew those. The Ken Groupen system uh, was a more secure message indicator than was used by the Army and the Air Force. There was also, I'm assuming there was a low volume of message traffic compared to what Army and Air Force Enigma was doing. So a low volume of traffic makes it harder to break the daily settings because you need enough messages so you can run your statistics or use your Zagalski sheets to uh, attack patterns, repeated patterns that you're seeing over a series of messages. Um, and then, um, you know, they can't decipher a whole lot of messages initially because they don't have the information on rotors 6, 7, and 8, and they don't have any information on uh, the Ken Group and system that the German Navy was using. So the strategies to break a naval enigma. Uh, the idea was to capture machines, ciphers, and codes from German ships at sea. You also were going to exploit the machine's inability to encipher a letter onto itself. Uh, you were going to use traffic analysis and early decodes to develop known plain text message cribs. And, uh, you know, this takes time. You'll use mathematical techniques to estimate the rotor, ring, and reflector settings. And you do, and you're going to do this through frequency analysis, Bayesian analysis uh, using plain text cribs, and then of course the use of the bomb, which which starts at the beginning of uh, March 1940, uh, to try to solve the plug board. And this is an, and this is one thing where Gordon Welchman made a, a significant contribution. Uh, Gordon Welchman devised what they call the diagonal board, which made it, which was a, a physical device that was fitted on on the bombs which made it possible to solve for the plug board, set, plug board settings separate from the rotors and reflectors. This is really important because um, you're getting on order maybe 3,000 messages a day from Enigma. 
between everything. So that's the German Navy, Army Air Force, the Swiss, the Italians, other, com other countries that are using Enigma. So it was really important, you know, and everybody wanted to use the bomb all the time because the bomb could, you, you could use the bombs, you could program it and just use them to try to solve everything at once. It would take longer. And there was so much message traffic and everybody wanted to get time on the bombs. Um, using the statistical analysis, using the Zagalski sheets, sheets excuse, um, the British would develop their own Zagalski sheets. I believe they called them the Jeffrey sheets, but they did the same thing. So Alan Turing was very big on uh, using these non-bomb non methods to try to solve for the rotors and the reflectors. And then at that point, all you need to do is go to the bomb and try to solve the plug board. It saved time. And of course, we can't have this briefing without a picture of an actual Bletchley Park bomb, which is what we have here. So uh, Bletchley Park workflow. So on here, messages would come in from a variety of sources to Bletchley Park. In this example, uh, this is an example of a message that comes in from a Y station. And the Y stations were listening posts that were set up with the purpose of monitoring uh, either specific locations or specific frequencies for specific types of message traffic. This is what the, this is what the British were doing. So messages would be intercepted and they would be brought to Bletchley Park. Now the traffic analysis tried to determine the source of the message. Now not sure but I think the intercept control determined which hutch to send a particular message to. For this example uh, we're looking at huts 6 and 8 but it could have been determined that it was say an Italian Enigma message or maybe something else like a Lawrence message. Um, so that would come in and then intercept control would decide, okay, this needs to go to hut eight. When the message got to hut eight, uh, the people working in that um, hut would first, they would try to get a crib from a message. And a crib was going to be known plain text that you think is in that encrypted message. And you're using that knowledge along with the fact that the machine can't encrypt and cipher a letter onto itself. You can use that to start eliminate possible uh, rotor and reflector combinations. And through your statistical analysis, through your cribs, uh, through your Jeffries or Zagalski sheets, you would get to the point where you had a pretty good idea of, I think that this is the arrangement of the rotors for this particular message. And based on that, you would develop a menu, which was basically a program that you were going to put into the bomb machines itself. And then you were going to start running the machine and eliminating possibilities until you got to the point where you were very certain that you had the correct rotor setting and the correct, excuse, excuse me, the correct plug board settings. And then from that point, you would finish doing the decryption. Now, once you've done that decryption, in hut 8 it would get sent over to hut 6 where they would actually do the translation once the message was translated then um, that message would eventually leave Bletchley Park probably going to MI6 where they would actually decide what to do with the message so that's a little bit different than in the movie. In the movie, you get the you get the impression, in each, at least earlier in the film, that you know they were doing the decryption at Bletchley Park, and then they decide, you know, and then they were the ones to decide who should get the messages or what should be done with the messages. And that really wasn't the case. And uh, I think later in the movie they actually clarify that. There's a conversation between uh, Alan Turing and um, the character representing MI6. I don't remember his name, but. Um, in a, in a nutshell, this is how the uh, flow would work, you know, through Bletchley Park. So at the start of the war, as I said, you know, they didn't have information on road on some of the rotors. They didn't have information on like how the how the message key indicate the message key indicator system worked. We're talking about naval enigma. So 
they had a hard time breaking messages basically until those bombs came online but they used that early but they used that early time when they could break messages that was still in that was still important even if you couldn't break very many messages and you could only break them after a long period of time when maybe the the mess the information in the message wasn't useful anymore it was still important because that gave you information on how the messages were structured and understanding how the messages were structured understanding the kinds of words and terminology they use in those messages will go back and make it easier for you to try cribs in the future for future messages in order to um, break messages faster and more efficiently so during the war um, you know the British understood that geez this would be a lot our work here would be a lot easier if we could actually get our hands on Enigma machines and or the code books and like things like the bigram tables that were used to um, to do the Ken group and the uh, message indicators. So early on, there was an effort by the British to actually capture uh, German uh, ships who would have who would have Enigma machines. And uh, what the Germans were doing, they had ships that were in the North Atlantic. They were weather ships, and those ships would be would be transmitting, you know, throughout the day weather information back to Germany. So the British would be able to find out where those ships were through uh, you know through you know radio direction finding and there were three s specific cases where they were a actually able to capture German weather ships there was the Krebs in March 1941 the Munchen in uh, May of 1941 and the Lorenberg in uh, June of 1941 so these are captures they didn't really produce a lot of high-level useful information that Bletchley Park could do simply because it was easy enough for these weather ships to see we're out here in the middle of the Atlantic. All of a sudden, we see some smoke on the horizon. Probably the British. So the first thing they do would chuck their enigmas and their code books, everything overboard that they could. But it was a start uh, for the British. The real scores were the three U. There were actually more than three U-boat captures during the war, but these three were important specifically because they provided high-level information for Bletchley Park. There was the U-33, uh, which was a Type 7A that was captured in February of 1940. And from that capture, Bletchley Park got rotors 6 and 7 for the M-3. Now, the British would have eventually probably have solved for rotors 6 and 7 and 8 just through like reverse engineering, but this greatly speeded things up. Uh, then probably the biggest score uh, was the U-110, which was a Type 9B uh, in uh, May of 1941. And there, an actual M3 machine was recovered, along with the cipher sheets. Those would be your daily sighting sheets. Uh, the short signal codes that the Germans were starting to use to uh, reduce transmission time. And then there was something called the Reserve Hand Verfahren, which was a kind of backup emergency code that was uh, a paper code. So this was a big score for Bletchley Park to get all that information from the U-10 especially the cipher sheets because then they could go back for the period of time that those cipher sheets cover they could go back see what messages they had gotten and they could try to decrypt all those again and even if the messages were you know old enough that the information wasn't tactically useful being able to decipher that again it gets back to uh, understanding getting a handle on message structure and content which greatly speeds up uh, the decryption process down the road and then finally, there was the U-559, which was a Type 7C that was captured in October of 1942. And that's when the Allies recovered an M4 machine again, and all the uh, cipher sheets, signal books, short signal books, etc. And uh, that, was, that, was a, that was a huge score for the Allies because the, the M4 and, and the Shark... Um, what they called shark that cipher that uh, cipher system that was used with the m4 uh, that had come online in february of 1942 and there was like a nine you know there's like a nine month blackout when bletchley park really couldn't read any of those m4 messages and if you think about february 1942 what's going on it's the U-boat offensive off the uh, united states east coast so not only can you not decrypt these messages but that black blackout period 
you know, that's a, that's a, that's a huge, that's a huge win for the German Navy in their efforts to operate off the Eastern seaboard. So how successful were the allies? This is really a, um, this is really a difficult question to answer. Some historians estimate that Bletchley Park's massive code breaking operation, especially the breaking of the, of the U-boat Enigma, the M4, that it shortened the war in Europe by as many as two to four years. Now, if Turing and his group had not weakened the U-boat's hold on the North Atlantic, the 1944 Allied invasion of Europe, D-Day, uh, that could have been delayed by a year or more. And, um, you know, that's because, you know, the North Atlantic was, was the route that the ammunition flew fuel, food, and troops had to travel in order to reach, you know, Britain from the U.S. Um, Harry Hinsley, a member of a small, tight-knit team that battled against naval enigma, and who later became the official historian of British intelligence, underlined the significance of the U-boat defeat. Um, any delay in the timing of the evasion, even a delay of less than a year, would have put Hitler in a stronger position to withstand the Allied assaults, according to Hensley. And, you know, I, I, I have to agree. So I guess we're never going to really know, you know, the exact role that Bletchley Park played in winning the war. The only thing you can really say is that, you know, it, it was significant. It was significant especially in the land battles uh, in North Africa where the Germans relied heavily, the German Army and Air Force relied heavily on, on, on Enigma during that operation. And the volume of message traffic that they were generating and the fact that that system was infinitely easier to break than the, uh, than the Kriegsmarines M4, it's, it's, it, there's no doubt that Bletchley Park certainly played a role in winning that aspect of the battle uh, in the Med and uh, North Africa. And that's it for today, everyone. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the briefing and we'll come back again. Feel free to contact me via email. I am on Discord, Twitter, and I do have a Patreon. Thanks to USNI for doing the job they do so well. Their publishing arm is an invaluable resource to the preservation of naval history. Consider becoming a member so their work can continue long into the future. Till next time, peace out.